All right, I'm uh, Rob Reeder. I'm the invited talks chair for Soups this year, and I'm very excited to introduce uh, the speaker that we have today. Uh, Chris Segoyan is a privacy researcher and activist uh, who works at the intersection of technology, law, and policy. He's principal technologist with the Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project uh, at the uh, ACLU. Um, I think a lot of us uh, know Chris, and he's been part of our community for a long time, and I'm very excited to uh, hear what he has to say to us today. So with that, Chris. Where's the clicker? Here it is. Let's see. One second, guys. Here we go. And I think that'll work. How about we get it? Can we get up on screen? For once, it's not my fault, which is always good. So while I'm waiting for the slides to, to show up, I'll just say um, how uh, excited I am to be here. Um, it was always very difficult for me when I was in graduate school um, because my papers kept getting rejected by technical conferences. Um, I mean, I, I have a background com in computer science and computer security, um, but I started doing work at the intersection of law, policy, and information security. And specifically, what I was studying was the way that um, technology companies facilitate and enable surveillance of their customers by the government. This is my, I finished my dissertation two years um, before the, the first Snowden documents surfaced. Um, and in many ways, the problem that I faced was that there was never anything new technically. The new stuff was always the discussion of the social impact and the legal issues. And so it was very difficult for me to find um, a home for my research. Um, it actually even took a while for my advisor to understand that what I was doing was important and legitimate. Yeah. So I see my slides there, but I don't see them here. <laughs> We're good? Okay. Uh, let's see. There's a present button over here. All right. Okay, cool. So um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I hope this is going to give you um, some food for thought. So this is, um, this is a very Im important person. Her name uh, is Valerie Caproni. And until a couple years ago, she was the top lawyer in the FBI. Um, she recently, uh, about two years ago, she left the FBI, went to a defense contractor, as many people do in the Washington, D.C. area when they're done with their government career, and then um, last year she was appointed to be a federal judge in New York. So Valerie was really, um, in many ways, the tip of the spear for the law enforcement community uh, in their efforts to combat the threat of widespread crypto. Um, for years, the FBI had been warning um, about this threat. They've been asking Congress to take action. They've been asking for new authorities and new powers. Um, as early as the mid-90s, uh, the director of the FBI, Louis Free, was testifying before Congress and talking about a world in which terrorists, pedophiles, and drug dealers were using unpenetrable cryptography. Uh, this, of course, led to the crypto wars uh, that some of you uh, lived through and probably still are suffering uh, the scars as a, as a result of. Um, but as recently as a couple of years ago, Right before the Snowden stuff dropped, about a year, year and a half ago, um, Caproni was going before Congress to ask for new powers. Um, and the powers that, were, that the FBI was seeking were the ability to force technology companies to put back doors in their products. Um, the FBI long ago gave up on the idea that we would use key escrow or that the government could force the use of particular algorithms. But what the FBI was seeking was the ability to go to a technology company and ask that company to secretly weaken its products. Um, now, thankfully, that proposal didn't really go anywhere after the Snowden disclosures. But I want to read you a couple things that Caproni said in her congressional testimony in 2010, because I really think it'll provide you some insight into how um, law enforcement views the widespread use and availability of the privacy and security technologies that you are all building or that are improving. Quote, there will always be criminals, terrorists, and spies who use very sophisticated means of communication that create very specific problems for law enforcement. She added, but criminals tend to be somewhat lazy, and a lot of times they will resort to what is easy. 
So as long as we have a solution that will get us the bulk of our targets, the bulk of criminals, the bulk of terrorists, the bulk of spies, we'll be ahead of the game. So really what she's talking about here um, is the fact that the FBI has these special solutions, these special tools. In, in essence, they have malware. There's a team of agents at the FBI called the Remote Operations Unit, and all they do is hack into people's computers, uh, deliver malware that can remotely activate webcams and microphones and steal documents from computers. Um, but that team doesn't scale. The FBI just doesn't have the resources to hack into every petty criminal's computers. Uh, and so what the FBI is concerned about then is the average criminal, right? Is the average criminal going to have access to full disk encryption? Not only will they have access, will the full disk encryption be enabled by default? If the FBI raids the house of um, some random offender, will the, device, will the devices they encounter be encrypted or not? Because they have the resources for the highly sophisticated actors, but they don't have those resources if they have to use them for every actor. Okay, so this is how the FBI views the world. How, how do they actually, what, what happens when they actually encounter the technology? What about the technology that we all use today? So when you go to Office Depot or Staples or the Apple Store and you buy a phone, Many things happen, right? So the, the ecosystem that you embrace um, will, will change the profits of a particular company. Um, it may mean that you have access to particular apps that you might not otherwise use. It may mean that you drive the decisions of your family members to use particular technologies because there are influencers amongst us and we uh, influence our friends and loved ones. But the decision about which phone or laptop or email service you buy or use can also impact your freedom. And I think many people don't think about this because when many people walk into that office supply store and buy that computer, they're not expecting that they're ever going to get arrested. They're not expecting that they're going to get stopped at the border. Um, and so this, when the decision to buy the technology is made, it's about which phone is the fastest, which phone has the new features, which phone is the cheapest, who has the screen size or the battery life. The decisions that are being made don't include the data security features uh, of, the, of the respective devices and services. Um, so I don't know how many of you have been keeping track of the law, um, but there was a, a major case at the Supreme Court just two weeks ago called the uh, Riley and Worry case. There are actually two cases. Uh, and the, the issue that the Supreme Court addressed was whether the police, when they arrest you for any offense, whether they can take, out, take the phone out of your pocket and start looking through it for information. Not just information that is relevant to the offense that they arrest you for, but information about anything else. Can they image your device? Can they access your contact list? Can they look through photographs? Can they look through emails that might, be, that might not necessarily be stored on the device, but are accessed via the cloud, but there are credentials stored on the device? These are really, really important questions, uh, and it took a while for this to filter up to the Supreme Court. So the good news is that the Supreme Court uh, said that, that you do have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your devices, in your mobile devices. They said that uh, basically techno that computers and phones are different than the, the physical world, and that just because the police arrest you uh, doesn't mean that they have uh, the right to, the, to go rifling through your emails and text messages. So that's really good news. But we've all had cell phones in our pockets for years. Uh, and, and for the last, you know, five, ten years, the police uh, in, in, uh, at the state and local and federal level have really been enjoying the ability um, to make use of, of this investigative technique, right? They, invest, they arrest you for some small offense, and then they suddenly have access to this device, which might provide them evidence that you've committed a much larger and completely unrelated offense, right? This isn't just limited to people being arrested for crimes, or being arrested under the suspicion that they have committed crimes. Uh, the policy of the U.S. government is that, and the, the case law that we're dealing with right now, is you essentially have very limited Fourth Amendment protections at the border, which means um, when you go through the United States border, the authorities can rifle through your papers, they can rifle through your, your, your luggage, and they can rifle through your electronic devices too. Not only can they search the device in that moment, but they can image the device uh, and, and then access data uh, at a later date. Um, you have very, very little protections there, 
um, unless there are technologies that you are using to make um, digital forensics more difficult. So you walk into Staples and you buy a device. Um, whether you buy the iPhone or you buy an Android phone um, will significantly impact what happens if you get stopped at the border. It will significantly impact what happens if the police arrest you for some offense um, pre the, this, this case um, or even today, right? So the Supreme Court said that the police need a warrant to search your phone. But if they get a warrant, now they can still go into the phone. And so there's this question of, okay, so they get the warrant. Now what are they going to get off my device? Um, and I think um, I, I grew up relatively poor, and so a generic cereal was always on our table. And I was told um, by my parents that there really isn't any difference uh, between generic cereal and the name brand cereal. And as a six-year-old you know, who really wants the cartoon character that you've seen on TV, it, that's a really tough message to take. Uh, but you know, my parents told me <coughs> that... <coughs> that the cereal is even made in the same factory, and they just put different boxes and different labels on it. Um, and I think many consumers um, are likely think the same about mobile devices. They, 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 they probably suspect that there is some kind of um, cosmetic difference, but I don't think they understand that there are deep and significant security and privacy differences between the mobile devices that they buy. Right? When they walk in the Apple store or they walk in the T-Mobile in the store, they may think, okay, well, this one costs $99 and this one costs $300. The $300 one is probably faster. $301 probably has a better battery. Maybe it has a better screen. I can, I can play games even faster. I don't think they're going to understand that there are significant privacy and security differences. And the reason they don't understand this is because these differences are not advertised. The major companies that make the mobile operating systems and the mobile devices to the most, for the most part, do not advertise the security and privacy advantages or disadvantages of their devices, with the um, exception of advertising to enterprise customers. So Samsung advertises their Knox um, hardening technology on the subway in Washington, D.C., but they're not trying to reach me. They're trying to reach the CIO of organizations that also happen to ride in the subway. So um, Apple has pr has produced and published a really fascinating iOS security guide, multi-page, really in-depth. Um, I'm not aware of any other company that provides this amount of detail in, into the security of their platform. And I'm just going to read you a couple things. So um, Apple describes this, this feature in, the, uh, in, in iOS, but also in the hardware. Uh, each security, secure enclave is provisioned during fabrication with its, own, with its own unique ID that is not accessible to other parts of the system and is not known to Apple. So at, at the factory, there's a unique random number that's gener generated at the, in the creation of the device that Apple doesn't know, and that random number is stored within a special place in the processor and never told to anyone else. When the device starts up, an ephemeral key is created, tangled with the user ID or the device ID, and then used to encrypt the secure enclave's portion of the device memory space. Um, so the, the guide that Apple published is really long, but, but very interesting. And what it basically explains is that Apple devices are encrypted by default. They're encrypted with a key that Apple doesn't have. Um, and it doesn't take any action on the part of the user to trigger that encryption. Um, now, to actually get the benefit, you need to have a PIN number or password. But the moment you enable a PIN or pass, then the device is encrypted. If someone if you lose your device in the subway or you leave it at a taxi, if your device is stolen, if the device is taken from you by force, um, without the PIN number or password, it can be very difficult to access that information. You essentially have to brute force um, the encryption on the device. Now, Apple describes this in this technical document, which is made for people like us. But this isn't something that you'll find in the Apple Store. It isn't something that you'll see in the commercials they have on TV, and it isn't something you'll see in the commercials that they have on the web. So Apple devices, mobile devices, are encrypted by default. The stored data is encrypted by default. In contrast, Google's Android operating system, it ha Android for, for several versions has offered the ability to encrypt, but users have to seek out an option. Uh, press a button, and then wait half an hour to 45 minutes while the device uh, d does that stuff. Um, the default uh, locking mechanism, if you wish to lock your device, the one that they recommend to you is this pattern-based lock, and that is incompatible with encryption. So to use encryption, you also have to have a PIN number or password. Um, 
So that's a big difference. The big difference is with Android, you don't get disk encryption by default. With Apple, you do. Um, and so with Android devices, it takes some action on the part of the user. Um, in addition to that, Apple, uh, at least with the latest uh, iOS devices, offers this fingerprint reader, which allows you to have a very long device encryption key that you enter when the, machine, when the device turns on for the first time, and then you unlock the device with your, with your thumb or fingerprint. Um, in contrast, with Android, you have the same pin or password used for both the device encryption and the unlocking. Uh, and what that does is it forces users to choose very short pin numbers or passwords because they are constantly entering them throughout the day. Right? There, a 20 or 30 character password is a non-starter for Android uh, because of the usability tax associated with the uh, frequent entry. All right, so we know from the social science literature that defaults matter. We know this. Yet Google is shipping an operating system that has poor encryption defaults. And of course, what this means then is that most Android users are not going to benefit from the disk encryption features. Most Android users are unlikely to even know that this exists. Um, of course, then, law enforcement take advantage of this. This is a device called Celebrite, or this is a UFED uh, by a company called Celebrite. They are a provider of hardware forensic solutions uh, to law enforcement and intelligence agencies. And essentially, this is a device that you plug a phone into, and it'll copy all the data off of the device. It, it clones the, um, the stored memory on the device. And if, if there's no disk encryption, there's no protection. I mean, there's, there's very, very little protection. Um, and so when law enforcement or intelligence agencies or, or customs agencies, when they encounter a mobile device, um, there's a big difference uh, in, in terms of the amount of data they can extract if it's an Apple device with a PIN number or password or an Android device with a PIN number or password. Uh, moreover, um, Google and Apple, in addition to the sort of encryption that's built into the, de the devices, both companies uh, uh, have offered, have decided to voluntarily build in, or to vo voluntarily uh, build the ability to unlock devices for law enforcement agencies. So if you use the Android operating system and you use the pattern-based unlock, um, and if you, if you fail the entry, uh, the, the entry of the, of the pattern more than a few times, you'll be prompted for your Gmail username and password that's, that's associated with the device. When the police sees an Android phone that is encrypted, and the, uh, or, or if they seize a device that they are somehow unable to get into, um, Google will reset the username and password, and will then um, uh, they'll reset the password to one that law enforcement knows, and then the police can get in. And, and to Google's credit, they insist on a warrant. But if your concern is how do you keep someone out of your device, the fact that the company insists on a particular piece of paper isn't a huge amount of comfort. Um, Apple also apparently has uh, a feature to unlock devices. We don't really know how it works, although we know that it involves sending the device back to Cupertino. Um, the speculation, the informed speculation that I've seen suggests that Apple installs a custom boot ROM onto the device and then cracks the pin on the device. They're not able to do um, an offline uh, crack with a supercomputer or anything like that. They have to do it on the device. It's slow. But if you have a four or six digit pin, it's likely that they are able to, to break into that. Um, so there is an impact to this. The, the, the fact that these devices are shipping with crypto, the fact that Apple now encrypts text messages by default that are transmitted through its iMessage system between iOS users without telling anyone, without requiring the users opt in, without requiring they set up public or private keys, it just happens. This actually is having an impact. And we are seeing law enforcement agencies complain uh, about this. this the, uh, every year, there's a report published by the Administrative Office of the Courts, which is a big central federal body, um, in which they report how many wiretaps took place in the last year. Uh, and they have, to indicate, they have to indicate in the reports how many times law enforcement agencies encountered encryption, and then how many times the encryption frustrated their ability to access the plain text of the communications. Now, unfortunately, they don't tell us which apps or services were the ones that frustrated the encryption. That would be um, good for us, but it would also, I guess, be good for the people who wish to hide um, from law enforcement. Um, but we, we are seeing some numbers, low numbers, like nine or 10 cases a year, suggesting that the availability and usage of encryption is making it more difficult for the police to wiretap communications, which is, you know, we can have a debate about whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing for society, but as technologists, it's pretty cool to see that the technologies that you're designing are having some impact. 
Um, okay, so that's, that's the mobile devices and mobile platforms we have. Um, on the desktop, things are a little bit different. So Apple does not encrypt um, Mac OS by default, but they do at least offer it in the operating system. Uh, and turning it on is pretty easy. It's a single button in the uh, security control panel. Um, now, it's important to understand that Apple only makes one version of its operating system. Whether you buy uh, an, a, a, a low-end Mac for 400 bucks or you buy a high-end, you know, fully tricked out um, uh, laptop for $3,000, you get the same operating system. And so it's the same features that are built into the low-end devices and the high-end devices that Apple sells, which means every Apple customer gets the ability to encrypt. I personally wish that Apple turned on encryption by default in the way that they do for mobile devices, um, but they haven't done that yet. Uh, it's also noteworthy that a few OS versions ago, um, Apple decided to start defaulting to escrowing the keys on their servers. So when you turn on disk encryption with Mac OS, if you don't check that, red bo that box next to that red arrow, um, your private disk encryption key will actually be uploaded to Apple servers. Now, they're not doing this to enable government surveillance. They're probably doing this for usability reasons that I'll get into later. Um, but it's important to note that a few versions back, this feature didn't exist, and then Apple um, pushed it, and they pushed it to, to be enabled by default. Uh, in contrast, Microsoft has long offered uh, the BitLocker disk encryption uh, technology for Windows users. Uh, I suspect that it's probably more secure than Apple's File Vault. Certainly, it, it works with TPM chips to make sure that keys are protected from, um, from physical attacks. Um, but in many ways, Microsoft views BitLocker disk encryption as an enterprise feature. And you see this in the way that they sell their operating system. So to get BitLocker, you need to buy the professional or ultimate version of Windows. Um, now, most consumers who go to Walmart and buy you know, a new laptop on Black Friday for $299, they don't get the professional or ultimate versions of Windows. They get the home version. Most regular consumers are using the home version of Windows, and this version does not include BitLocker by default, or at least it didn't until Windows 8.1, which just came out um, a few months back, maybe last year. Um, and even then, uh, 8.1 only has BitLocker enabled for devices with particular hardware configurations, and then Microsoft only enabled it by default um, for these 8.1 devices uh, with the keys escrowed by Microsoft. So, but for the last you know, 10 years, Microsoft has restricted disk encryption um, to enterprise customers, to people who pay a premium, which of course most users are never going to do. Most users don't even know that, what disk encryption is and definitely are not going to seek out a premium version of the operating system, upgrade their OS from home to professional, and then seek out the option to turn this on. It's definitely not going to happen. And so what this means then is that for law enforcement, the average Windows computer they seize is not going to have disk encryption enabled by default, or even built into the operating system. Uh, and so in this way, when you think about the generic serial versus the, the brand serial, there is a difference in the security. Now, it's not as big as on the mobile platform because Apple has made that decision for users by default. Um, but on the desktop, Apple users all get access to encryption. And Windows users, only a very small subset of the corporate users, get access to that technology. So a few months back, uh, last month, there was this whole scandal involving TrueCrypt being discontinued under really strange circumstances. The, the fact that that was a big deal reflects, reflects the simple fact that we are all dependent. All of us using Windows, who are not working for enterprise organizations, are dependent upon this open source project developed by anonymous developers for our disk encryption technology. How crazy is it that all of these people out there who, who want to use encryption software on Windows are having to seek out this third-party software, which is really difficult to use, um, because it's not built into the operating system. This is the status quo. So Microsoft has basically offloaded the consumer disk encryption market to these third-party open source developers. Um, and I think that's really wrong. All right, so when we think back to what Valerie Caproni was talking about, right? as long as we have a solution that will get us the bulk of our targets, the bulk of criminals, the bulk of terrorists, the bulk of spies will be head of the game. And the fact is, the bulk of people who are using Microsoft Windows or Apple's operating system are likely not using disk encryption. The default values and the, 
and the placement of this, of this technology as a premium enterprise feature means that most people won't benefit from it. If you leave your laptop in a car, you leave it on a plane, you're probably going to lose your information. If you work for an organization and your CIO mandates disk encryption and it's installed by default, then it's safe to lose your corporate laptop. But your personal device probably isn't encrypted because of the defaults set by these two large operating system companies. Now, I'll, I'll note that Google's Chrome OS does, in fact, include disk encryption and turns it on by default. It's weird. You have, on the, on the laptop market, Google doing the right thing, and on the mobile market, Google doing the wrong thing. Um, and I don't really know how to explain what's happening there. So when you, when you think about the prices that most Apple devices are sold at, we have to understand that Apple devices are luxury products. Right? They, are, they are status symbols uh, for people who can afford um, something a little bit nicer, that works a little bit nicer, that looks a little bit nicer, is a little bit easier to use. Um, and so what that means is that the, those who are more affluent get the security and privacy benefits without really having to shop around. Right? They don't, when, when you have you know, your 18-year-old and you send them off to college and you buy them that new MacBook before they go, you're not engaging in some kind of calculus about which device is going to keep them the most safe. You're just buying them the laptop that they want. And for many people, middle, upper class, a $1,500 laptop is not the end of the world, and so they buy these devices for, for their kids or for themselves and for their families. What that means, though, is that the poor, people who cannot afford a $1,500 laptop, they get screwed, right? And so the lack of disk encryption in generic Android phones, the lack of disk encryption in the low-end PC that you buy on Black Friday means that if you do ever get arrested by the, by the feds, if you do ever have the police stop you, if you do have your device cloned by customs when you cross a border, there's nothing stopping them from getting your data. And the thing is, in 2014, we know how to fix this. As a community, we know how to build devices and operating systems that are resistant to forensic analysis, but they're not reaching regular users. And in particular, they're, they're not reaching poor users who are the most likely to be targeted by law enforcement. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, the Supreme Court recently uh, ruled that a warrant is required to search your mobile device incident to arrest. Um, California voters in 2011, or not California voters, the legislature, the, the state house and senate here, passed a law that would have required a warrant for local California law enforcement agencies to, get a, uh, to, to search mobile devices. And unfortunately, the governor here vetoed that legislation. So between 2011 and 2014, California, it's, it's been uh, you know, no holds barred uh, for device seizures, even though the California companies that build these devices, or at least design the software, um, could do something about it. Uh, and so in many ways, the, the thing that, that I focus on, and the, the reason that I care about this, and the reason that I wanted to come and talk to you today, um, is that the law moves really slowly. Uh, but technology can fill the gaps where the law hasn't caught, caught up yet or when the law goes down the wrong path. Technology can protect you from your own government. It can protect you from someone else's government. Uh, if you live in an authoritarian country, um, that disk encryption feature built into the OS may be the thing keeping you safe. It may be the thing that stops you from being beaten by the secret police. Uh, and so it's vital that these features reach average users. All right, so that, that's what I wanted to talk about with regards to the mobile and desktop devices. There's one other thing that's sort of been, been bugging me for the last year or so. Um, so Glenn Greenwald um, really caused a firestorm uh, with the publication of the first Snowden story. Um, and the surveillance stuff is fascinating. The surveillance stuff is, is fascinating for someone like me who works on civil liberties issues, for, who works for an organization suing the U.S. government over these surveillance programs. But I think for your community, um, the last year should also be really fascinating because um, prior to April of 2013, um, the number of journalists I knew who were using encryption, I could probably count on one hand. Uh, that includes email encryption, instant message encryption, 
text message encryption, probably even disk encryption if they knew what it was. Um, journalists, the, the, the community of journalists didn't understand this technology and didn't understand it, its, its importance. And this isn't just like your vanilla journalist. I'm talking about national security reporters whose beat is to talk to government sources who would get arrested or jailed if they were to be found talking to these journalists. Um, this is a, a screenshot from um, a video that Ed Snowden made for Glenn Greenwald. Right? So Snowden contacted Glenn Greenwald and he said, I want to give you some stuff. Can you use, can you, do you have encryption support? And Glenn didn't know what this stuff was. And so Snowden made him the video. And like the really tragic story here is that Glenn like sort of watched it and didn't really understand it and uh, didn't really care enough to, to figure out how to install it. And then he couldn't figure out how to use it. And this is uh, from Glenn's book. Uh, it's really annoying and complicated, the encryption software. Um, and, and like you can get some cheap laughs out of you know, laughing at this te technological Luddite. But Glenn's a really smart guy. He just doesn't understand this really difficult to use software and didn't really understand why it mattered. Uh, and Glenn was not alone. Uh, and with the publication of that story, and then a few months before um, the, fact, the revelation that the FBI had sought the records of the Associated Press, in order to unearth some leaks. They'd gone to the Associated Press's telephone company and sought records of every telephone call coming in and out of an AP office, really sort of set the journalism community on fire. Uh, and so it's been really fun to watch as an experiment. Um, it's been fun to watch the journalism community try and figure out how to encrypt their communications. Uh, and it's important to understand that there isn't a chief information or chief security officer at most of these news organizations. And even where they have one, the CIO's job is to make sure that the website stays up and that they get ad revenue and that you know, the paywall is working. The CIO's job at the New York Times isn't to make sure that individual reporters are encrypting. And so over the last year, all of these really smart journalists have been trying to figure out by themselves how to encrypt their communications. So I don't need to, to tell you about Alma Witten's paper, Why Johnny Can't Encrypt, that's been cited, what, more than 900 times. But nothing's changed since that paper came out. The interface that she screenshotted in her paper in 1997, PGP basically looks the same today. If you're using it, I mean, so no one uses the official PGP application anymore. We all use open source software. So whether you're using um, GPG tools for Mac or... Um, Enigmail for Firefox or for, or for Thunderbird. Um, the interface really is the same, and the, and the conceptual barriers that people have around public and private keys, those haven't changed either. Um, so this is a, a screenshot of, um, of the Mac GPG Tools app, which is like the, the most widely used and most user-friendly uh, encrypted email uh, uh, tool for the, the Mac operating system. Um, and this is the, the screenshot, that, this is the, the window that you see when you create a new public key, a new public private key chain for the first time. So you're a journalist, someone's told you to go to this website, you download this tool, you double click on it, and you're met with this window. So what's important here is the only things that you're met with are your name and your email address. And the things that are hidden from you are the algorithms that you're using, which, okay, maybe it's fair to hide that because most people don't know the difference between RSA uh, uh, or, or any of the other algorithms. But then you have the key length. So I don't know how many of you use PGP, um, maybe a couple. Um, certainly in the, in the geeky, paranoid circles in which I circulate, 4,096-bit um, keys are the minimum. Everyone I know is using 4,096-bit keys. But all of the PGP applications that are being installed by regular users today default to 2048-bit encryption. And so you, if, you, if you go onto the MIT PGP key server and you search for people's names, you see this, like, this line in the sand. On one hand, you have the, the security nerds who all have 4,096-bit keys, and you have some journalists who employ security nerds, like the Wall Street Journal, all have 4,096-bit. And then you have the average people who all have 2048-bit encryption because they're sticking with the default values. So um, I'm just going to pick a few people... Uh, uh, it's, it's really unfair, and I'm not trying to shame anyone for bad practices. Uh, so this is, uh, these are the, the, the public keys of Matt Apuzo and Adam Goldman. These are two of the finest 
national security investigative reporters in the country. They caused major waves a year and a half ago when they revealed the widespread and, in my opinion, illegal spying on Muslims by the NYPD. Major reporters. I mean, these guys broke open a huge story. The NYPD's spying was taking place with the assistance of the CIA. I mean, this is really sketchy stuff. And, you know, you can see the, the dates on the creation of these keys, both January of this year, right? It took uh, six, seven, eight months after the first Snowden stories for these guys to, get, to jump on the PGP bandwagon. Um, just to be fair, you know, we should poke holes at my organization too. So my boss, Ben Weisner, who's Ed Snowden's lawyer, uh, and his boss, Jamil Jaffer, two of the finest national, uh, national security lawyers you're going to find. I mean, these guys sue the government every day for, for a living, and when they made their encryption keys, they stuck with the default settings of 2048-bit key size. Um, this is Mailvelope, which is a browser-based plugin for PGP. So if you don't want to have to go through the overhead of downloading um, PGP onto your computer, you can use this, this HTML JavaScript browser version. Um, and until very recently, Mailvelope actually defaulted to 1024 bits. This is really a bad thing, right? I think like some people might say, oh, 2048 bits, it's probably okay still. But there's no one out there who's going to say that we should be using 10, 1024 bits. Um, so this is the public key of Charlie Savage, the, one of the top national security reporters at the New York Times. And this guy breaks major stories, talking to you know, anonymous uh, government sources in parking lots, the whole deep throat business. There's no reason that he should be using a 1024-bit key, but in you know, August of 2013, he downloaded Mailvelope, and he followed the default settings and went through that process. Um, two other funny things that I've encountered in my interactions with journalists in the last year using PGP. So first is that many people still don't understand that the subject line is not encrypted. So I will routinely get emails with a very suggestive subject line and then an encrypted body within. Um, I also get email attachments that are encrypted that have a suggestive name in the file name. So we can laugh, but like this leads to people getting shot. Right? People getting arrested, people getting shot, people getting fired, investigated by the government. This is crappy software. Right? These people have taken the step to try and protect themselves They've downloaded the software they've been told to, is, is the right software, and then it fails them. The software that we are recommending, the, the best that our community has to offer, sucks. And it's not the security that sucks, it's the usability that sucks. It's the default values that suck. Um, and so what's been clear over the past year um, is that the, the existing tools um, that, 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 are, that are out there, that we recommend, that we, in many cases, use and proselytize to our friends and families, these don't suit the needs of non-technical users, which includes journalists, which includes whistleblowers, which includes human rights activists in countries where their lives are at risk. The tools that have been built for us and then abandoned don't work for the average person. Um, this is an excerpt from Glenn Greenwald's book, um, so this is talking about his interactions with the editor of The Guardian, like, right as he's like, heading to Hong Kong. Um, by that point, we knew that speaking by telephone or Google Chat was out of the question. Both are far too insecure. We somehow failed to connect via OTR, the encrypted chat program we've been using. So Janie suggested that we try CryptoCat, a recently released program designed to impede state surveillance that became our primary means of communication throughout my time in Hong Kong. So CryptoCat has had a bit of a rough ride um, since its initial introduction, um, and it's it's gone through security audits, and it's definitely improved. But at the time that Glenn Greenwald was using it, it was thoroughly broken. Now, the developers of CryptoCat didn't know that at that point, but the, the algorithms and, and code in CryptoCat were not up to snuff. Um, now, I'm not blaming Glenn or you know, the editor of, uh, of, the, of the US Guardian site. You know, she read an article about CryptoCat in Wired Magazine that said this tool will keep you safe from governments and said, OK, that's great, and I can use it in my browser. Fantastic. Right? And so the fact that journalists feel like they need to use these other tools, because the tools that we've tested and, and designed and audited don't work for their needs, that's our fault. We have let everyone else down. Um, as, as researchers, as software developers, 
as informed members of the tech community who can put pressure on the companies that give us the commercial software that we depend on. We, we should be doing more. So things are changing. Things are finally changing. Um, there's a really cool uh, uh, application that, that it's very new and you shouldn't use it for anything important yet, but um, uh, there's a, a, an app made by Glenn Greenwald's chief technologist, uh, Micah Lee, called Onion Share that it lets two people exchange a file. Uh, so Micah was reading Glenn's book once it came out and realized that one of the big problems that the journalists had who were working on these stories is they didn't have an easy way to exchange files. The, the best thing they had back then was to use PGP, which meant that for, for two people to securely exchange a file, they had to learn what public and private keys were, they had to establish public private keys, they had to download software capable of making them, and then figure out how to use it to successfully send a file and not screw up by naming the documents Snowden Docs. All right? It's a really, really high barrier. So we're starting to see tools being built that can meet the needs of journalists, that, but that are built on a solid foundation of peer-reviewed technology. So the, the magic secret sauce in, in this Onion Share app is Tor. Right? The people have been tearing Tor apart for years. It's just a bit of usability stuff that's been built on top. Um, so why do we have such crappy software? Why do we have such crappy defaults? Why are the $50 billion companies that provide us with our mobile and desktop operating systems, with our web browsers, with our chat applications, why are they selling us or giving us software that's insecure? I mean, so take our, our hosts here. Facebook has a team of highly qualified and probably well-paid usability experts with an expertise on security and privacy. Like, they know how to study stuff. Yet, and, and every big tech company in the area does, yet we are getting the tools uh, and products that don't meet our needs and, and definitely fall apart um, when users need them most. Why, why are we getting these bad defaults? The first reason is sort of a usability tax um, associated with data loss. Right? So um, you are a parent, you, um, you've got two kids, you've been eagerly taking photos and videos of your children since the, the day they were born. You have, you know, they're now 16, 20 years old. You have their entire lives in photo form stored on your Mac laptop. Backed up using uh, whatever they call it, time machine. Um, and then you forget your password. Now, Apple has defaulted to turning on disk encryption for Mac OS, and they've defaulted to turning on disk encryption for, for time machine and you forget your password. So the security engineers in, in the room say that for software to be secure, it has to fail secure, not fail open. When a user forgets their password, that means they lose their data. But if you are a company that sells regular products to consumers, telling a consumer that they have just lost the only copy they have of every photograph of their children is a non-starter. Right? That kind of design decision leads to really angry customers uh, and when you're selling a product for like 50 or 100 bucks, and it's not being advertised on security, it's being advertised on usability. It just works. When, when those are the design features, then failing hard when the user forgets their credentials is not an option. Right? And so this is a real area of, of, of research needs where we don't really know right now how to build software that is resistant to the state but that fails gracefully when users will inevitably forget their credentials. We have some ideas, right? There have been research studies and papers um, that allow you to use your friends when you, um, when you forget your password. You can you know, trust a few people with shards of your, uh, your information. But actually, that's even worse because uh, under US law, you may have a Fifth Amendment right to not reveal your own password, but you don't have a Fifth Amendment right to not reveal your friend's password that you've been entrusted with or a shard of your friend's credentials. Um, when, the, when the attacker is essentially a $10 billion intelligence agency with, with pseudo powers, with the ability to compel, um, designing products and services that can withstand either the technological force they have or the coercive capabilities that they have to threaten someone with arrest, it's really difficult to do that while still making software that the average person can use and that will keep working properly when they forget their password. 
the second force against widespread default crypto, the business model. Uh, I suspect most people in this room know Vint Cerf, one of the grandfathers of the internet. Um, he was at a panel a couple years ago uh, in Nairobi uh, where we, we spoke together. We talked then about why Google doesn't encrypt stored data, emails, search records by default, with a key not known to Google. And he said, we couldn't run our system if everything in it were encrypted because then we wouldn't know which ads to show you. This is a system that was designed around a particular business model. And I think this really sort of accurately sums up the design constraints that Google has to work with. They can only go so far, right? And the last year of um, security upgrades that Google has, has made post Snowden have really been about protecting the connection between you and Google, but not protecting you from Google. It's very difficult to do that when the provider of your service is an ad-supported company. The third force is government pressure. Right, so tech companies routinely receive requests from the government uh, for their users' data, for assistance. Tech companies have a lot of issues in play in Washington, D.C. They may want to merge with someone. They may want to buy someone. Maybe they get in trouble for violating people's privacy. Um, there are political brownie points that companies need to maintain. Uh, and companies may be loath to burn all their brownie points in order to tell the feds, you know, get lost. We're not going to hand over our keys. And so what we see is companies building features that are not required by law. So neither Google nor Apple are required to offer the ability to unlock phones for law enforcement. There's no law requiring that they do that. They are doing that to be good corporate citizens, but also to have some negotiating power when the government asks them to do something that they don't want to do. If you ask us to do this thing, we'll take away your ability to unlock phones. Oh, okay. Maybe we'll think that through. Um, so the state has the ability to whisper in your ear and famously to make you an offer you cannot refuse. And no one wants to wake up uh, with a horse's head. Sorry, sorry. Um, but this is, this is the coercive power that the government has. Right? No executive wants to go to jail. Um, my favorite Eric Schmidt quote, and of course everyone in our community has a favorite Eric Schmidt quote. Um, my favorite Eric Schmidt quote was when he was being interviewed by Rachel Maddow a couple years ago. And she asks him, um, why Google doesn't do more to protect its users from the government. And Schmidt, in a moment of honesty, says, there's a problem with expecting us to protect you from the government. And that's that the government has guns, and we don't. And the last thing is ma market power, or lack of market power. So Apple has done a lot of things to protect their users, even though they don't advertise them as security and privacy enhancements. Um, Apple's devices, their mobile devices, are encrypted by default. They have... Um, a, ch a chain of trust that stops people from installing malicious code and engaging in evil made attacks. They enabled um, transport encryption, end-to-end -end encryption for iMessage and FaceTime. They've done a lot of really interesting things. The reason that Apple can do that is because they control the vertical stack. They make the phones, they make the operating systems, they design the processors that go into the devices. The only thing they don't make right now uh, are, are the screens and the baseband chips. Um, and when you control the entire stack and the ecosystem, you're able to build security into your products in a way that doesn't cause things to fail. Google doesn't build its own hardware. They rely on a bunch of OEMs to build the devices, and then they rely on carriers to sell the devices to consumers, and the carriers all modify the software. It's not really possible for Google to make major waves there because it might upset the carriers, or it might upset the OEMs, or requiring disk encryption by default, might require the addition of, a, of a, a, you know, a chip that uh, the OEMs don't want to pay 10 cents to put in the device. Apple has the freedom because they are, in essence, a monopoly um, and can leverage the power they have. Um, so we've come a long way in the last few years. Things are getting better. Um, as recently as 2009, um, I don't know how well you can see this, but there was this option in the Gmail settings. This was the 13th of 13 configuration settings. This was the feature that turned on SSL in Gmail, which no one ever did. Uh, in, the, in the blog post when Google, Google announced the availability of this checkbox, they said, HTTPS can make your mail slower, your computer has to do all this extra work, that's why we leave the choice up to you. This, of course, is a false choice. It's a false choice because users didn't know what this choice meant, 
And the feature itself didn't even say that it was about security. Unless you knew what HTTPS was, you wouldn't know why it was an important thing to turn on. Um, that was 2009. Of course, in 2010, Google turned on SSL by default for Gmail. And in the few years that followed, Google has really upped their game to the point that they are now leading the industry um, for transport encryption. And this, of course, set um, uh, a lot of people's hair on fire uh, when uh, the Washington Post revealed that the NSA and GCHQ, or GCHQ rather, had been monitoring Google's internal data center traffic, um, which led to two particular Google engineers to write blog posts that essentially um, said, fuck those guys, uh, those guys being uh, GCHQ and the NSA. Um, so Google has improved things a lot. Um, most of the tech companies uh, within 10, 20 miles of here, the, the big cloud companies, now encrypt data in transit by default. Even Yahoo, which really, really, really dragged their feet, finally turned on SSL in January of this year. Um, so things are getting better, um, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, the software that most people use probably isn't as secure as it could be. The operating systems that people are using are still not seizure resistant. They're not arrest resistant. The mobile communications apps that people are using in most cases will, will not be end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, and we know how to do better. We just need to force the tech companies to give us the products that I think we all deserve. Thank you very much. We can take just a few questions before the break. I thought I would just reinforce your uh, initial point by uh, sharing what happened when I got home from the conference yesterday. My high schooler uh, decided not to go to summer camp and ride horses, but rather go to the Santa Clara County uh, Sheriff's Office uh, Police Teen Academy. Uh, and uh, she, yesterday they... Uh, uh, we're very proudly showing her how they have a van full of equipment that they can pull up in front of your home, uh, hack into your Wi-Fi, and uh, get everything off of all the computers in your house. Or if they happen to stop you and uh, get your cell phone, they can uh, help themselves to all that data. It was uh, interestingly relevant to this conference. So was that Santa Clara? Santa Clara, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> We file Freedom of Information Act requests, and uh, I'm not aware of law enforcement agencies hacking into people's Wi-Fi connections, so I'll be filing a FOIA about that one. <laughs> yes, ma'am. When you mentioned that you can't be compelled to give your own password, but you can be compelled to give somebody else's password, I think we could all defend ourselves. I can't remember my password, much less somebody else's. <laughs> so, so the case law, so I'm not a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. This is not legal advice. Um, the, the case law is not so clear on the issue of forced disclosure of encryption keys. We just lost the case in Ma at the uh, Supreme Court of Massachusetts uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, the short version of it is if the authorities can argue that they know what's on the computer already, then you have less protection. So you have more protection for things they don't know are there than things they do know are there. And it, I'm not going to go into the reasons why. but. Um, the best you can hope for is that at least they have to force you to hand over the, the thing. Whereas when your data is in the cloud, they can get it without even knowing. Um, but we're not quite there yet in, in having the law protect your keys. Right now, it's really just technology that's protecting it or your poor memory. Hi, um, how do you balance the ubiquitous use of encryption, which would be sounds like the ultimate state for you, with the use of encryption by pedophiles, terrorists, uh, ransomware, that we're seeing huge spikes in ransomware right now? Um, it's a good question. Uh, the bad guys are always going to be one step ahead of the good guys. And depending on your definition, the bad guy and good guy may mean different things. Um, I think that the, the criminals have the motivation to learn about this stuff because they, they think they might get caught. Most of us don't think we're ever going to get in trouble. Most of us don't imagine that we're going to be detained at an airport. Um, certainly, you know, three days before the FBI showed up at my house in 2006, I never imagined that that would happen. Um, and by the time they did show up, um, I didn't have any disk encryption on any of my devices. So I certainly have fixed that problem now. Um, 
you, you know, look, um, bad guys use technology. Um, criminals use cars, they use roads, they use FedEx, they use the internet. Um, they're always going to have these tools. Um, but what about the rest of us? And I want to make sure that the technology that the average person uses is safe and secure. Uh, and I think for far too long, the state has been putting its thumb on the scale to keep strong privacy and security software out of the hands of the average person because they don't want it to end up in the hands of the people that they want to catch. And you know, the fact is, there's no terrorist laptop. There's no drug dealer cell phone. Right? We all use the same technology. That's why you know, we're so upset that the NSA has been secretly subverting the de design of cryptographic algorithms. If there was a Russian government crypto algorithm that only the Russian government used, NSA would focus on that. But when everyone is using you know, AES, then the, then the NSA has to attack AES. Um, you know, we live in a world where um, states, criminals, governments, companies, um, lawyers, doctors, priests all use the same technology. And so you know, my, my position is that that technolo technology should be safe and secure. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and uh, take the break here. Um, you can come up and talk with Chris. Um, we are going to be back in here at 11 o'clock. There is also an overflow room right down the hall. So if you prefer to spread out a little more, there is room there. And we're just videoing right in here. And those of you speaking in the next session, come up and let's uh, check the technology. Thanks. Thank you.